Hey, good morning, Expedition. Donovan here. Uh, just to uh, clarify a couple of things, uh, for those of you watching from home, rest assured, I am not in the auditorium this morning, still being quarantined. This is actually pre-recorded, and I am in a, a room by myself, well, with the exception of Dave, who is uh, very, very far away from me wearing a mask. Uh, yes, if you have not heard, I and my family have COVID. We're uh, a, a good week and a couple of days into things, and so thank you for your concern, for your prayer for us, mild symptoms thus far, which we are thankful for. Uh, if you are sitting in the auditorium this morning, hi everybody, it is probably most weird for you because you're watching me on a screen, everybody else live streaming uh, or in the courtyard is just used to watching uh, me on a screen. But if you're in the auditorium, hi everybody, good to see you, hope you are all well. Uh, we are, <coughs> excuse me, continuing our uh, uh, series this morning, but before we do our essential series, let me pray. And then we will uh, jump into things. Father, thank you so much for uh, your word, which is true and trustworthy, uh, that we can uh, learn from and understand who you are and your heart for us as people. And uniquely this morning, as we study this doctrine of the end times, that you would not only help us to understand information, uh, to have correct beliefs, but those, that those beliefs would uh, shape how we live. And we pray that in Jesus' name, amen. So this is our last uh, official week of our Essentials series. I want to remind you that next Sunday is a Q&A, question and answer. And so if there's anything that we've covered all throughout our Essentials series, anything in those various topics of doctrine that you wanted to have elaboration on or something that we didn't cover, something that didn't quite make sense, please write out the question. You can either put it on uh, a Facebook uh, message thread. You can email it to the office, office at expedition.church. If you're sitting in the auditorium this morning, write it on one of the communication cards and put it in one of the boxes on the back. Next week, we'll just it'll be kind of a, a smorgasbord uh, or uh, a, a variety, if you will, a cornucopia of, of topics as we do that. So this morning, talking about the end times could not, once again, be a, a more appropriate uh, topic to discuss doctrine of. Let me remind you, the reason that we decided to do this series, the reason that we've been doing it is because our entire life is shaped by what we believe. Every single thing about how I live is shaped by what I believe to be true. And so that could not be more true than my beliefs about the end times. End times. The fancy theological word for that is eschatology. Eschatology. What, and here's why eschatology matters. Here's why the doctrine of the end times matters. What, what we believe about the future absolutely determines how I live in the present. What I believe will happen in some future event, for sure, without a doubt, determines and shapes how I live in the here and now. It influences our decision-making, our priorities, everything about how we live. Now, a couple of qualifications before we jump into this morning's doctrine. First one is this. Uh, Qualifications, qualifiers maybe is the appropriate word. First one is, there are a lot of people who are very intelligent, who also love Jesus very much, who vastly disagree about doctrine of the end times. It's one of those topics. So, so this morning, some of you might be frustrated because I'm not going to talk about certain things. It's because this is an essentials series we're going to the very bare minimum basics. Also, this morning we're covering a ton. So hang in there, buckle up your seatbelt, and, and right now choose to be, be mindful and to, to stick with it. So just want to acknowledge that. So having said those things, here is our doctrine of the end times. Doctrine of the end times. Christ, Christ will return to judge all mankind, permanently removing the presence of sin 
and fully restoring all of creation. Let me say that one more time. Doctrine of the end times. Christ will return to judge all mankind, permanently removing the presence of sin and fully restoring all of creation. Now, let me, let me briefly describe where we're going this morning on this doctrine it, and, and briefly describe really the doctrine of the end times, okay? It's this. We're living, we're living in present time. There's going to be a moment in the future where Christ returns. When Christ returns, he is going to judge all of humanity simultaneously with his return, after which humanity is judged, they will go to one of two eternal destinations, either hell or heaven. So I'll just say that again. We're living in a present time. At some point in the future, Christ will return. When he returns, there will be a judgment of all humanity, at which time all of humanity will be, uh, will, will, uh, be directed, if you will, to uh, one of two eternal destinies. Let's start with the first part of that, the return of Christ. All kinds of uh, scripture that we could refer to, and and we have to simplify it for the sake of time this morning, but Titus 2.13 is a great one because it says this. It says that in this present time, we are waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. This time that we are presently living in is a time of waiting. It is a time of, of waiting for something that is hopeful. What are we waiting for? We're waiting for the appearance of Jesus Christ. Christ will once again appear to us. Uh, 1 Thess- Thessalonians chapter 4 describes in more detail that time when Christ appears. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, uh, 16 through 18 says this, the Lord himself, speaking of Jesus, will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of a trumpet. When Jesus came the first time, it was very humble, uh, a little bit kind of under the radar. When Christ returns the second time, it's going to be very different. Uh, it's, very, it's going to be uh, more of the commander of an army than a humble uh, infant child. And the dead in Christ will rise first. So those who have, <clears throat> who have already uh, died, Christians who have already died, uh, then, verse 17, we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. A very uh, dramatic picture for sure. And so... Clearly, the message of Scripture is that at some particular point in the future, Jesus Christ is going to return, <clears throat> excuse me, a second time. Uh, he, he lived on this earth, came the first time, died, rose from the grave, ascended into heaven, but he's going to return. So the first key element is that at some point in the future, we should eagerly expect the return of Christ. Now, let me, let me uh, ask a question and answer it at the same time, something that a lot of people have been asking me over the past several months, uh, mostly followers of Christ. I've, I've gotten the question, and I think a lot of people are asking the question. I've heard the question asked to other people. They say, uh, Donovan, do you think that this is the end times? Do you think that, that this is This is the time where soon Christ is going to come back. And my definitive answer to that question is yes. Yes, yes, yes. However, however, uh, some of you aren't going to like this answer. Uh, The Bible says that it is always, always in some form or fashion the end times. Ever since Christ left... Ever since Christ uh, left and went to heaven, every single moment potentially has been the end times. Every single moment is potentially the time where Christ would return. Now, is it actually the end times? No, because nobody really knows when that's going to be. Do I believe that 
the circumstances that we're experiencing in the world are an indicator, a clear indicator that this must be the end times? No, I don't. I don't. But could it be the end times? Absolutely. Uh, every single day should be lived as though it is the end times. Here's what I've noticed about American Christians especially. Whenever times get tough and there's some sort of unrest and things seem to be you know, a little bit out of control, Christians seem to panic and they go, of course this must be the end times. They've been doing it for, for generations. And, and my answer to that is, okay, Americans, what you're experiencing today it's not necessarily a for sure sign that this is the end times. What you're experiencing is really just what most of the world experiences on a regular basis. When we feel like things are out of control, <clears throat> excuse me, when we feel like things are, are really, really bad, that's just how most of the world lives. Americans are just used to a lot of security, a lot of safety, a lot of the illusion that we are in control. And so I don't believe that there's anything happening currently that would for sure definitively say, this is the end times. However, every day, every day could be the end times. That's what I'm trying to say, and I hope that that makes sense. Luke chapter 12, verse 40 says this regarding the timing of Christ's return. It says, you also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming, speaking of Jesus, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. So when is it going to happen? We don't know when it's going to happen. You're not going to expect it. He's coming when you don't expect it. 2 Peter 3.10 says, The day of the Lord. The day of the Lord. Christ's return. That's what it's talking about. The day of the Lord will come like a thief. Now let me, let me tell you the beauty of that analogy there. Uh, the picture that is being given is that when Christ returns, it's going to be very much like a thief coming into your house and robbing you. Uh, I, here's, here's the point. You never know when a thief is going to come into your house and rob you. Thieves don't call ahead and say, hello, uh, hey, yeah, I, I, they don't make appointments. Donovan, uh, just want to let you know, Saturday, 3 a.m., I'm going to come and I'm going to rob your house. And we go, oh, thanks for letting me know. That's not what thieves do. Thieves don't say, hey, it's not like, uh, you know, when your internet goes down and they say sometime between Tuesday and Thursday, be doing. thieves don't book uh, uh, a time period. You, the, the, the only time you know a thief broke into your house is after they did so. And you go, oh man, that's a bummer, a thief broke into my house. They don't let you know what's going to happen. So uh, we do not know when Christ will return. And anybody who says, and people have said it all the time, and they'll continue saying it, hey, this is when Christ is going to return. As soon as somebody starts saying they know exactly when Christ is going to return, stop listening to that person because they're making stuff up. Uh, so what happens when Christ returns? Remember, Christ is going to return. Simultaneously with his return, there are going to be, the Bible describes, two judgments, two distinct and separate judgments. One of those judgments is for Christians, and the other judgment is for non-Christians. Christ returns at a time we don't know. When he returns, there is simultaneously going to be two judgments. One of those judgments is for people who have placed their faith in Christ. Another judgment is for those who have not. The judgment for those who have placed their faith in Christ is called the judgment seat of Christ, the judgment seat of Christ. You may have heard it described as the Bema seat. Uh, Romans 14, 1 Corinthians 3, 2 Corinthians 5 all talk about the judgment seat of Christ. Now let me be clear on what this judgment is. This judgment, we are not, Christians at this judgment are not going to be judged for our sin. Christ has already been judged for our sin, and so that judgment is over. That, that judgment has been taken care of. Uh, at, this, at the judgment seat of Christ, Christ is going to judge his people to determine the amount of blessing, the amount of status, and the amount of authority that we will have in eternity. And Essentially, that the judgment seat of Christ is going to say, how, how well did you, as a follower of Christ, 
live according to God's good will during your time on earth. It, that will be the judgment. The judgment for non-Christians, so the one judgment for Christians is the judgment seat of Christ. The judgment for non-Christians is called the great white throne judgment. We see this in Revelation 20. I believe also in uh, Matthew chapter 25. And essentially this, this judgment is one that determines Christ. Revelation 20 has this really uh, compelling picture, this really descriptive, beautiful picture, but also very fearful picture of books being opened, and Christ will look in the book, and those who have, who have trusted in Christ for the salvation of, of their souls, those who have asked forgiveness of Christ for sin, their name's going to be written in a book of life, and if your name, name is not written in the book of life, then you will, you will have an eternal destiny uh, separated from God. Those not, those, those not written in the book of life, it, it is infinitely tragic and horrifying. There are various descriptions of what hell is like in the Bible. Jesus talked a lot about hell. If you were to compile all of the uh, descriptions of hell, you will find some descriptions that are uh, immensely lonely Others that describe intense pain and suffering with no escape or relief. Let me share just a couple of them with you. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 9 says that those whose eternal destiny is hell, they will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His might. We see in 2 Thessalonians one of the worst things about hell is a complete and total absence from the presence of God. There is not even a, uh, a minute form of, of God's presence, no, none of his grace, none of his mercy, total absence, total separation. Uh, every single person, regardless of whether or not they believe in God, is still experiencing degrees of his goodness and his presence. Uh, and so, so we enjoy that here on earth. There's going to be a moment where, where it's completely removed, uh, far, far worse than anything we might imagine. Jesus describes hell. Let me give you a couple of verses. Mark chapter 9. Uh, Jesus describes hell as a place where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Uh, in Matthew 13... Verse 42, he says, in that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And so clearly, you know, you, sometimes you hear this, I hear it occasionally, when, when somebody says, hey, why would I want to go to heaven when all my friends are going to be in hell? Uh, there has is, there is never been a more absurd, infinitely tragic statement than, than that. Why would, I, why, why would I want to go to heaven when all my friends are partying in hell? It is a gross, gross, massively uh, incorrect understanding of what hell would be like. Now, let me answer this question. Uh, there, are, there are oftentimes in eschatology or in the doctrine of end times these various words or descriptions uh, that I personally believe, and I'll put the Bible aside for a second, I personally believe are symbolic or metaphorical. Some of, some of the words are literal, sometimes though symbolic, symbolic or metaphorical. Uh, when when uh, Mark 9 says the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched, uh, one, of the, one of the reasons I believe that is because how can there be complete and total darkness when there's fire? Fire gives off light. And so are there literal worms eating uh, people's bodies I'm, I'm not sure if that's the point or the intent, but what I do know is this, that the reality of hell is far worse than any symbolic words that might be used to describe it. Is fire bad? Yes. Is darkness bad? Yes. Are worms bad? Yes. But the reality of hell is words fall short in describing the horrific reality of what it is. Thankfully, thankfully, there is an alternative to hell, an infinitely good alternative. 
uh, for those whose names are written in the book of life, who, who uh, do experience uh, salvation, then we have the promise of an eternity in the presence of God. Second Peter 3.13 says this, according to his promise, according to the promises of God, according to his promise, we, followers of Christ, those who are saved, according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Now, there's a ton going on there. Uh, let, me, let me read it one more time, and then I'm going to try to unpack it. According to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. I have to give you a little bit of the overall story of picture, and it is this, that in creation there was a time where everything was good, sin entered the world, everything got corrupted, and so the work of Jesus was to undo the work of sin. A lot of times when we think of that work, we correctly think that the, the removal of the curse of sin is for the individual. That's absolutely true. Christ personally removes the consequences of sin in my life. However, a significant part of the work of Christ is also the removal of sin and the curse of sin from all of creation, from the cosmos. And so this, this promise of Christ's return and the judgments, after, after humanity has been judged, what we're told is that at this particular time in history, creation is going to be completely renewed and redeemed and it's restored because every single trace of the consequence of sin is removed. And, and heaven and earth, now here, stick with me here if you... If you dozed off for a second, heaven and earth are no longer separated, but are joined together as one. One of the, one of the most significant misconceptions that people, Christians and non-Christians alike have, about eternity is that Christians, uh, when Christ returned, Christians go to heaven. Kind of not true. <laughs> that the the truth is this, and the, the story of Scripture is that when Christ returns, heaven comes to earth. And so, if, is it true to say when Christians die, they go to heaven? Yes, that's true. Is it true to say uh, that when Christians, before Christ return, die, do they go to heaven? Yes. But heaven is not where Christians will spend eternity I'm going to say that again because some of you are, you need to pick your jaw up off the floor and you're going, wait a second, he heaven is not where Christians will spend eternity. The, the Bible, what the Bible describes at, at Christ's return is that right now heaven is a place. When Christ returns and restores everything, heaven comes to earth, earth is renewed and restored, and heaven and earth are joined together. And so the, the, the truth of Scripture is that for eternity, those who are saved live out their eternity on a renewed and restored earth that, that very much has the fullness of heaven on it. We see in 2 Peter 3, if the, if the worst part of hell is the absence of God, the best part of this new creation, the new heavens and the new earth is the complete and total presence of God. That's why 2 Peter says it's where righteousness dwells. Revelation 21 says this. Again, a very, in, in some ways, uh, beautiful, cryptic, uh, mysterious passage. Revelation 21, 1, I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, behold, the dwelling place of God is is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, 
nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne, Christ Jesus, is saying, Behold, I am making all things new. Amen to that. Everything, and and I love this picture, everything that is even remotely related to the curse of sin is completely gone and everything's renewed. Revelation says, speaks to some of these very horrendous things that we experience in life, tears and death and mourning and crying and pain. They all, get, they all pass away. They become a part of the old, cursed creation. And so in this new creation... Evil is completely removed. There's no more sin. There's no more consequence of sin. No more sickness or death or fear or suffering. There will be, listen to this, in in this eternal state, there will be a contentment and a joy and a peace beyond anything we have ever known. And whenever you have experienced in life a moment of goodness where there's just a sense of everything is right, take that and multiply it by infinity. And that's your continued state of existence. Uh, one, of the, one of the worst things about uh, thinking about the eternal state is some of the misconceptions that people have. And unfortunately, one of the things that a lot of people think, including Christians, is people, people say, hey, Donovan, are we just gonna, are we gonna spend eternity floating around on clouds, wearing white robes and playing harps? Let me tell you, if that is heaven, if that is the eternal state, I'm, that doesn't sound very good to me. Thankfully, thankfully, that's not what our eternal state is. Far from that, we are going to, in this renewed heavens and earth, not just earth, but all of the cosmos renewed, we're never going to get bored. And and part of what we're going to do is we're going to be able to create things, and we're going to be able to invent and explore and discover and learn the things that maybe you always wanted to try out but didn't have the opportunity to. You'll be able to try it out. And it's not like you're instantaneously going to be able to do it. There's going to be an a unfrustrating process of, of learning how to do that thing, of developing skills. And we'll still do work. And the work will still be challenging because challenging work is very rewarding, especially when you see the product of a work. But different from work now, it's not going to be frustrating work. I do all kinds of work. You know, I do a little bit of carpentry, I do a little bit of welding, I do a little bit of masonry, I do a little bit of everything, not anything well, and there's always a point of frustration where I maybe throw down a tool or I just stop doing it because I mess something up. It's frustrating, but there's going to be work that's challenging but rewarding and not frustrating. And in this eternal state, we'll enjoy good art and we'll enjoy good music and good food We'll enjoy food from our own culture. We'll enjoy food from other cultures. Think about the history of humanity and the, and the cultures from uh, Revelation as this beautiful picture of every tribe and every nation. All these intermingling cultures where you can get to know different people and different uh, environments and you can interact with them and visit one and visit a different one. And one day we might gather in the street for a block party or a festival Some days we'll go to visit something that we really enjoy, that we find to be meaningful and beautiful, but other days we'll be able to venture out and discover and explore something new. Every time you have a a moment in this life where you say, man, that's just really good, that should be an indicator of, for those who are in Christ, what eternity has in store for you. Whenever you feel a moment in life where you go, oh, that's frustrating or that's less than ideal, you can have hope that, that that experience, that feeling, will never even be known in your eternal state. And so how do we, how do we 
take all of this and live beyond belief? What do we, what do, we do with it? Well, I think there are some clear implications of that. And if you remember what I said when we started, what we believe about the future determines how we live in the present. What we believe about the future determines how we live in the present. And in terms of this essential series, this doctrine, living beyond belief, if, if it is true and trustworthy that Christ is going to return, then my question for you is, are you prepared for his return? Are you living as though he's going to return? If Christ indeed is going to judge all of humanity, first of all, is your name written in the book of life? There is one of, the Bible says, there is one of two eternal destinies, an eternity away from the presence of God, of intense isolation and suffering, an eternity in the full presence of God, with nothing but beauty and goodness and full righteousness. So is your name written in the book of life? The clear and compelling message is, trust Christ for the salvation of your sins. Let him be judged for your sins so that your name could be written in the book of life. Say, Christ, I believe that you lived and died for me, that you rose again. I, I, I place my life in your hands. I receive salvation. I make you the Lord of my life. Share the good news. Why would, not, why would we not share the hope of heaven? If there is an eternal destiny that, that Scripture speaks of, why would we not compellingly say there's an eternity that, that you can have that is going to fulfill every single desire of your heart? Share the message. Share the message of, of, of uh, the goodness of God. I want to end with a quote from Martin Luther that I think adequately summarizes how to live beyond belief. It's a, it's a good one. He says this, uh, live, live as if Jesus was crucified yesterday, rose from the dead today, and is returning tomorrow. Live as if Jesus was crucified yesterday, rose from the dead today, and is returning tomorrow. And if we could somehow live that way, we would absolutely be living beyond belief. Let me pray that God would help us to do that. Father, for everybody listening, wherever they are, whenever they are, I pray that first and foremost, they would place their faith in the work of your Son, Jesus Christ, we thank you that he lived the life that we should have lived and died the death that we should have died and that he removes all judgment so that when we stand before the throne, we can, we can be confident that Christ has sufficiently removed the penalty of sin in our life. Help us to live as those who will one day be assessed. Help us to live in a way that we would be found worthy of, of your name, the name of Christ, of having taken seriously your call to live out your goodwill for us on this side of eternity. Father, thank you for the hope of heaven. May the, may the beauty and the majesty of, of a restored creation and your goodness and a presence with you motivate us. May the horrors of hell compel us to share your good news with others. And we pray all of this in the name of Jesus, for his sake, because of his work, amen. Hey, God bless everybody. Be well, take care, and uh, make sure Q&As, if you've got a question or answer, let us know what it is. Take care.